Hey, how's it going? Dan Schindler here with Stephen Schindler. We are here on Yes Shift, another news desk edition. The first one of 2023, actually. Yeah, that's right. Wow, I didn't even think of that. And this isn't exact, but uh, it's about our hundred and, I'm going to guess, 14th episode. Maybe. Of everything combined, because we've done what eighty six of the regular episodes. Yeah, something like that. And this is more than two dozen of the news desks, so we're we're like up around there. Uh, but thanks for following what we do. If you follow what we do, if yeah. you're new to this, uh, strap yourself in. Void were prohibited. Not available in the state of shock. Yeah, and it's great to be back. It's been a little while, but there was like a little taste of us on Vintage Rock Pod uh, recently when they let us do like a couple minutes talking about Owner of a Lonely Heart. And Yeah, that um, was a really cool honor. Yeah, so check out Vintage Rock Pod whenever you can. Yeah, maybe um, drop a link in the in the post later or in the comments. But uh, what do we do again? Yeah, we're a father son podcast. You're the father, I'm the son. We talk. Thanks about, for the reminder. We talk about yes, it's members and former members and people they work with. And for these news desk episodes, we try to catch up on some of the most recent news. And there's been a bunch that's come out this month. Uh, there is a the Warner deal uh, stuff about the cover of an upcoming Yes album. Um, I saw the John Anderson Q and A last Wednesday, so I have details about that. Where he talked about Zamran, Chagall, and some other stuff, and a lot of stuff. Yeah. I mean, uh, Trevor Horn, Bill Bruford's got some new videos. Oliver Wakeman, Rick Wakeman, no relation. Um, uh, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all kinds of stuff. Uh, so let's just launch into it. Where do you want to start, Steve? Yeah, so let's start with the Warner deal that was announced on yesworld.com. Oh, yeah, that was kind of, well, for me, I don't know about you, but for me, that was so out of nowhere. Yeah, it really was. Um, so uh, did you want to read through it? or? Yeah, I... yeah, let's, let me uh, read through this because this was uh, surprising news to me. I forget that this even happens and something similar happened, uh, I think that same week with Justin Bieber, this was interesting. Yeah. He sold his catalog for two hundred million, right? It was two hundred million. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, and it's a record for that kind of sale. It's the highest sale of an artist under seventy years old. See, usually it's someone that's been around for decades. And then I was shocked to read that it was to pay off money owed for concerts that weren't fulfilled, I think because of his paralysis and everything with his his face. So then the yes thing happened and uh, uh, quoting more, Warner Music's, I'm looking over here, that's where my notes are, folks, so it doesn't yeah. cover <laughs> us up. Maybe I should just cover us up. Warner, or me anyways, Warner Music Group's global catalog division has announced the acquisition of the recorded music rights and income streams for, yes, is Atlantic Records era catalog. More than 50 years after the British rock group's debut, Yes remains one of the most successful, respected, and influential rock bands of all time, with more than 30 million albums sold worldwide. I think even hardcore Yes fans kind of forget that. You know, we get just so used to being attached to the the band's members and the band's in, as an institution and the band's music that we forget sometimes about that side of the legacy, which is really interesting to me. The acquisition continues a long-standing relationship between the band and Warner Music that now spans over half a century, beginning with, yes, the self-titled 1969 album, debut album. But they didn't say what the name of it is. <laughs> yes. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> the deal encompasses landmark work such as Fragile, Close to the Edge, and 90125. The full purchase includes 12... 12 studio albums, as well as live recordings and compilations. In making the announcement, Kevin Gore, Warner Music's president of the Global Catalog, said, My introduction to Yes came while working at a record store in Ohio in 1983. So he's got to be younger than I am, I hope. <laughs> I loved the 90125 album, where well, there you go, and went to see the band live. 
where I was introduced to their catalog of, of incredible songs. I've been a fan of her since, we're, and we're absolutely thrilled and deeply honored that the strong relationship between Yes and Warner Music will continue forever. That's a nice statement, not a, an ounce of any... Is this a real word, Steve? I asked Steve because he went to college for English. He's a writer. Um, pompicity? <laughs> there's there's no pompousness is what I mean in that right. statement. Yeah I, yeah, I don't know if it's a word, but I get what you're saying. And it's kind of nice knowing that uh, Kevin Gore is a Yes fan. Uh, and, you know, it, I think it's always nice whenever the people in power have a reverence toward the music and the um, humility too. He's not like saying, dig us. We scored, you know, it almost <laughs> becomes a negative or like they're knocking the band down by the purchase. And this doesn't have that vibe whatsoever, which I really appreciate. Right. And there's a joint statement by the band saying the entire yes family came together and worked enthusiastically with Warner music group to secure this historic deal, ensuring that these iconic recordings will continue to be curated in the optimum manner to delight their fans across more than five decades while also finding and developing new audiences for this timeless music. Um, and at the John Anderson Q&A thing I attended, uh, John said he was asked about this and he said he wasn't as interested in selling the rights and suggested that they wait a couple years, but everyone else wanted to do it, so he went with it. Um, and what's interesting about this deal is it includes the Atlantic catalog. So that's uh, studio wise, that's from Yes to Big Generator and the live and compilation albums in between. And then post Big Generator, we got stuff like Yes Years, Yes Story, Highlights, Very Best of Yes, and a word Yes, Yes Remixes, you know, one of your favorites. Um, it's such a great listen. Uh, the 35th anniversary collection, the word is live, high vibration. I had to look up what that is, but I believe that was a box set several years back that had all the studio albums up to Big Generator. Progeny, seven shows from 72, the Stephen Wilson remixes, wow. and a, cup, a couple recent-ish live albums, Topographic Drama and Yes 50 Live. So not including the live albums released on other stuff like Frontiers and BMG, the I Rhino believe, stuff, right? Yeah, um, it's Rhino. So, yeah, yeah. So a couple things. Um, let me gather my. I had a question that was kind of multi pronged, so I'm trying to think of the easiest way to facilitate this. And if anyone knows the answer to this, please chime in. Chime in, anyways. Tell us where you're watching from. I'm in Globe, Arizona, yeah. which is about I, 100 miles east of Phoenix. Yeah, I see that. Ted Williams says hello from Columbus, Ohio. Thanks for all you do. Awesome uh, bass player, baseball player. Yeah, Edward Kuyper uh, says watching from Cote d'Ivoire. I hope I pronounced that correctly. If not, I'm sorry. Uh, Raleigh Gideon watching from Nigeria. Brian Cahoon chimes in saying gents. Henry Whitley, uh, Eli Golden. Thanks, guys, for chiming in. Yeah, Brian from North Carolina. Um uh, Dave Watkinson, hi chaps, 8 p.m. England, plenty of news as always. And James Dusewix, uh, hello from Coatesville, Pennsylvania. So yeah, thanks you all for tuning in. Um, so so well, while I formulate my yeah. question, talk about how, why John Anderson didn't let me watch the Zoom, but you got to. Explain that. So I think that'll benefit John <laughs> if you explain why he wouldn't let me in the door um i feel like the way you're wording it paints a picture <laughs> that might give people a different impression there's no riff i've interviewed john and there's no riff that i was kind of joking right. but go ahead and explain <laughs> yeah well so i heard about the q a because i'm subscribed on patreon and some of these have been like open to everyone but when i looked it said um like the post was unlocked for me. And so I thought it was just for patrons. You know, I wasn't sure if you'd be right. allowed in. And I think you were also busy that day. You had like meetings back to back and whatnot. Yeah. And yeah. I think it's the day I was at a workshop uh, for three days. But um, but the point is, is that John has a Patreon and, and go ahead and join John's Patreon. I, I haven't only because I can't partake in so many of these things. And honestly, just because... I keep forgetting. I should just freaking <laughs> subscribe. 
Um, but yeah, so the question I have is the people in Yes who benefit from this sale, I'm guessing it's only the ones that own publishing rights to any of those songs, which mm. might not be everybody. Because often the publishing rights only go to the person that writes the lyrics and the person or pe the people who write the lyrics and the people who write the music, not necessarily everybody who recorded, unless that's how their own interdeal works. And I remember Stuart Copeland explained to me once that whoever writes the lyrics gets 50% of the publishing, unless there's some other deal. Like Dave Matthews pays his entire band equal publishing rights as him, regardless of who writes the songs, which is awesome. So I'm curious how this deal pans out if it's only the people who wrote music and lyrics for songs on those albums, or if it includes everybody who performed on all those albums. Does it also include the managers that had to get involved for each player? You know, like, I just wonder how deep this goes as far as the distribution. And I don't remember seeing how much the deal was for. Do you, Steve? Um, so they didn't mention it here, but I saw somewhere that apparently Billboard has estimated... Uh, Not just going to say Billboard for estimated. Yeah, the financial stuff. So um, according to what I'm looking at here, Billboard estimates that uh, the Yes catalog generated about $3.2 in annual revenue over the last three years from 2020 through 2022, and further estimates Yes's royalties at almost $1 million. The band also appears to own master recordings beginning in 1991, but those albums um, didn't have much consumption last year, collectively accumulating less than 2,000 units in the U.S. Uh, Billboard estimates WMG's acquisition of Yes master rights and royalty income streams at about $20 million to $25 million. So, yeah, I've been looking at this quote, like, a couple times, and I still don't know, like, what it all completely means. And yeah, that's kind of a splattering of statistics. It doesn't really say how much the deal was for. Yeah, and I haven't been able to find anything that says the finer details of the deal with Warner So and, like, who benefits. So, I don't know, maybe there's someone out there who might have more insight than we do because at the moment, like, some of this is, like, speculation, like, who gets what and whatnot. Yeah, and um, I know that... Um, Alan White was a stakeholder in, in the company, yes. So I'm wondering if Gigi is a stakeholder or if that goes to the estate and the same with Chris. Yeah, that, that's a good point, yeah. Um, so another thing about this deal is it makes me wonder if there's some sort of plan to re-release some of this stuff on the horizon and if so if there's any bonus content we haven't gotten before i would be all over that honestly you know? so what i would like i i agree what i what i am not interested in is um an endless string of in the endless dream <laughs> of remasters and stuff i i don't want it to not sound like it did when it came out even though we've oh both... you mean like yeah like some kind of like the stephen wilson thing yeah yeah like i respect the stephen wilson work but yeah, it's i think it's an experiment but yeah yeah i think it's important to encapsulate the music as it came out of that time because it also represents the technology of the time the techniques of the time, even though I would love to get my hands on the masters for Tormato and personally remix it. Yeah. <laughs> I would love to do that, but yet I I if they do re-release this stuff, it'd be nice to see the non-Roger Dean albums of the non-Trevor Rabin years, because those should stay as is. There's just something about that that um the albums with John Anderson, I that do not have, you know, Tormato going for oh, the one. Yeah, Time and a Word, the Yes album. Y yeah. Uh, I, I, I'd, I'd keep the original I, yes for those album first, as is. I agree. I think from Fragile Forward. So is it only those two albums? Is it only Tormato um, and 
I feel like, like there's like post fragile. Yeah. Like yeah. I, I, so I'd like to see it. those out Roger Dean versions come to light. Sorry, folks. I didn't mean to drag that point out so long, but, <laughs> but I, I, it's a curious question. What, what does it mean? Is it just a financial business decision or are there other plans? But whatever happens is if it comes out, they've sold the income streams and they've sold the rights. So the yes members who were involved in any way, shape or form will get nothing from anything from those albums happening forward. What about merchandising? To me, that's an income stream. So a close to the edge shirt with the album cover, like does that include Roger Dean? Does he still not get a cut from those al albums sold with his cover? Was he getting a cut before? Were those a flat fee? I'd love to know not to be nosy, but just <laughs> from a business standpoint, that interests me, how, how yeah. that all works out. Because there's so many, this matrix, you know, if you picture a cube, that's four dimensional. <laughs> There's so many different aspects to this. I don't know how Roger Dean was paid or gets paid. Is it a fee plus royalties? Is it royalties only? Is it, you know, and it might've been different in 1973 than it is now. I'd love to know all that yeah. stuff. Yeah, they're all interesting questions. We'll probably not get the answers to, but it's interesting to think about. And of course the rights to stuff from like union onward is different because yes went through like maybe six or something record labels with all those albums onward and it's like you really know complicated not just that but the that changed as much as the um sorry this is called a major senior moment the members that was that <laughs> that cha like when you says you said that i pictured a merry-go-round going too fast and people flying off it and some of them were able to get back on others weren't and it just kept yeah. changing so much from from the keys time from talk to keys to open your eyes to bah, 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 you know it was just like uh, it was hard to keep track of you know yeah um so interesting stuff and i'm curious to see if they maybe warner does like a yes 55 type of re-release campaign who knows but is 55 i know there's yes 35 but after 50 is the half decade something to celebrate other than 75 because um, 75 is three quarters of a year whereas 55 is half and five tenths yeah know? it's it's really weird how for some reason we as humans don't see like for like like 35 or 45 as big as say 25 which is a quarter of a yeah. century but i think 55 like just design wise looks pretty nice so. yeah and 35 they made a big deal out of that with songs yeah. from songas i celebrate my half birthday even <laughs> though i'm not supposed to have cake i always ask anja hey it's october 2nd can I have half a cake? What? It's my half birthday. She thinks it's the silliest thing in the world, but it is what it is. Yeah, Dave Watkinson chimed in saying, I think we will start to hear yes music in TV, film, and advertising, so more yes. Um, yeah, that, that'd be interesting if maybe we hear them pop up, their music pop up more and stuff, so I guess we'll see. But you mentioned Roger Dean, and uh, there's some interesting Roger Dean stuff. So over on his Facebook and I believe Instagram. He's been uh, making posts about some yes related stuff. So first up, and we have like the photos of these ready. Um, he On the 19th of this month, he posted a yes logo saying this was a recent design for the new yes album, which didn't end up getting used, but it was an interesting concept. Steve I agree. Howe Steve Howe had been thinking about the Nebra Sky Disc, which was discovered in Germany in 1999 by looters who sold it on. For those that don't know, the Nebra Sky Disc is considered one of the most important archaeological finds of the 20th century. It seems to depict astronomical phenomena, but interpretations differ. A fascinating discovery worth further reading. I wanted to use a texture and basic color pattern for the logo. I like the way it came out, but it didn't actually end up getting used as the colors disappear into the finished painting. I'll be posting about that soon. Um, so if that's not being used, I'm curious about whether it could be used for something later yeah. down the line. But on the 24th, uh, he posted a video titled Part 1 Sketches, and uh, it showed like 
the painting for the new Yes album. You know, he showed it in a sketchbook. He showed a small canvas version. And uh, he said, a very old friend, Hank Rogers, told me a story about when he went camping once. Late at night, he went paddling into the middle of the lake, and as the ripples settled, the lake became a perfect mirror to a very brilliant night sky. He said, it felt like being in space. I thought that getting that in a painting would be a good thing. I started with a horizon low down with a lot of sky, but then I realized, no, I'll show with ocean in the main area with a sky just a sliver enough to show it is mirrored. Then I decided to put in a rock formation, a viewing point for the sky. Once I have the basic structure of the painting figured out, I'd start playing with the colors. And um, he also posted a video of like a little bit of a painting process of like a bigger canvas. So I hope we see more of those um, in the coming weeks, uh, maybe. But just looking at the painting, like what are your impressions of it, Dad? I love it. Um... I love the the colors, and I'm behind the painting, folks. And I'm going to zoom in. Let's see if I can do this. Yeah, there you go. I I love it. You know, I'm a I'm a blue person. My big drum set is blue. Um, I I've always loved his technique from the repeater graph, creating shadows. Whereas this is not the repeater graph creating the shadows, but that style, and the splatter, and the way the shadows are done here. I mean, it just looks so real. And that sliver on the horizon. Um, it's just he's just so he's such a visionary um what are your thoughts i love it it's different too it's different but it's roger yeah i feel like it's i like that it's different from the last couple yes albums like the quest it's not the same thing um it, it kind of does remind me of the Royal Affair live album a bit just the rock formations and like the starry skies like i feel like he's been on a starry sky sort of mood recently with like with the upcoming uh downs braid association album which we'll talk a little bit about uh later but yeah i really like this and it's it's kind of a surprise how open they're being with the painting of this which i assume it's for the next studio album which uh we had heard might come out in june but i honestly wouldn't be surprised if it got delayed to autumn or something does that but, happen um, it hasn't been delayed. <laughs> I but... was being sarcastic asking if that happens. Oh, like just in general. Yeah, yeah it, it, it can happen. Uh, it, it does really happen. But <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm excited because it it looks different. It's like I'm just always excited about new Yes music. And, and, and what yeah. direction is it going to go in? Is it more the same? Does it go backwards, ultra proggy? proggy? Does it leap into the future like? 90125 did not i'm not saying we're expecting trevor sounding guitar but i just mean <laughs> excuse me cut the hiccups as far as his style of music having a, a pivot somehow you know yeah well we'll just have to see um and the chambers project announced that roger dean is also doing a talk called avatar art of the steel at uh 627 east main street in grass valley california on february 4th which is also the last day for the secret path at that location um and yes i'm still editing the secret path uh documentary um i've just been sick recently but yeah i'm still working on it yeah for those who don't know back in october yeah back in wow back in october steve and i went to see secret path the exhibit by Roger Dean and Freya Dean, and it yeah, was San Francisco. Yeah, in San Francisco, it was amazing. We they were kind and let us film a ton of footage, and Steve is putting that documentary together. Um, I probably still need to lend some voiceovers, possibly, but uh, the, it's something that's filling in the spaces of everything else. Um, Steve is also my right hand man for drum talk tv produces a lot of stuff there works behind the scenes and does a lot of his own stuff and like you said he had a cold recently so he's been filling in those gaps with putting this together um if all steve had to do was that documentary it'd probably have been out in the first two weeks but i'm not gonna <laughs> let him do that so <laughs> so it's it's coming along um and uh, i'm excited to see it because it was there and i actually quite like the fact that time is passing because then boom oh yeah wow yeah that was so amazing i can't wait and for anybody who has seen it 
I promise it'll be a treat. And for those of you who haven't, it certainly will be. And we'll hopefully encourage you to go see Roger and or Freya's work in person any chance you get. There's nothing like seeing these actual paintings, the original paintings in person. We saw a framed version of the version, the framed original Relayer album cover. Just amazing. Um, the colors and to just look at the detail. My mother was an artist. I grew up around art. My wife is a professional artist. Roger Dean, other than the two of them, has always been my favorite artist. And to see this stuff in person was just amazing. And Freya has done some stuff you'll see in the documentary that's not only three-dimensional. My wife does three-dimensional mixed media. This was that, but some of it, like, without giving too much away, was manually mechanical. You can make parts of it move really, really tremendous stuff so i can't wait for that to come out hurry up just <laughs> kidding no pressure yeah and i saw that dave watkinson posted that he went to the trading boundaries uh exhibit and so he has like some nice pics on over on his facebook page nice so, yeah roger dean stuff is always great to see in person even when there's like footage or pics of it um so then we go on to john anderson's stuff and like I said, I'll try to abbreviate uh, some of the Q&A stuff, but he did make a couple announcements even outside of that. Over on YouTube, there was the video that says Zamran is coming, um, and it included 10 minutes of snippets of music from that. There was even a bit of narration, and oddly, it seems like he's also reusing lyrics from Revealing Science of God, the craving penetrations offer you know that part oh wow um, yeah so i'm curious to see what how it seems in context but and for those who don't know because there might be some who don't know maybe they're more into the trevor rabin years or their newest yes fans or they're younger but zamoran is olias's son of olias of sun hillo john anderson's first solo album which is just still so amazing and just so john I mean, yeah. it it's really a tremendous album, and I'm so excited. He's been working on this for 20 years, is it? Uh, like since 2000, uh, apparently. Um, and the story for it, uh, so it says, the songs of Zamran will be based on the creation of the structure of the planet Earth and how the planet works with references to crystals, crystal streams and ley lines. Uh, John continues, at each juncture, you find out, you find about more about the mysteries of the planet Earth, and then more about the mysteries of the human condition, and then more about the interdimensional condition of this planet, and how many interdimensional beings are out there that we don't see. And then, of course, the extension of that is the intergalactic people that we don't see. And uh, he also hinted that the story may cover the idea that quote, Mother Earth is an almighty computer, unquote. Um, mm. And in the Zoom Q&A, John said that Zamran is four hours long and the first two hours are done and ready for release, but the next two hours still need some tinkering. Wait, um, the album is two hours long? Uh, he says four hours, maybe five at most. Oh, so the whole, so he's not going to release them separately. So the whole album is four or five hours long? Yeah, so I just want to make sure I'm hearing this right because we don't get that <laughs> much anymore. You, you right. know, what I mean, this I'm, is... curi I'm curious to see if he'll release it in chapters or maybe it'll be a box set or something. Yeah, so, that's what yeah. I'd I'd like. That that's really cool. I can't. No wonder it took him 20 years, <laughs> and and he's been busy doing other things as well. You know, with Paul Green and um, the other thing he does with youth, and and then there was ARW and ABWH and, and yeah, EIEIO. Yeah, and the band geeks touring the East Coast this spring. Yeah, that's um, who I was trying to remember the name of. So. Yeah, I, I saw that. I think it was on Ticketmaster. It's advertised as Yes, Epics, and Classics featuring John Anderson and the band geeks. And he's 78. So, yeah. <laughs> <He'll> be... <sighs> Amazing. Yeah, so I'm excited for Zamran. I hope we see it this year. But in any case, it seems like more progress has been done on it. Um, he also recently did a workshop last Sunday in San Francisco. Uh, so this was uh, for his musical Chagall. And 
he provided in the Zoom Q and A. He provided a bit of background on the musical when someone asked him about some memories of making the 1998 solo album, The More You Know. Uh, he said he had just finished music on Chagall and the story was in, uh, he was in Hawaii finishing working with Yes on Keys to Ascension, then went to Maui with Jane and they were supposed to go on tour a month later, but uh, somebody in the band didn't want to go. Of course, we know that's Rick. And then John got a call about a uh, house uh, with 15 acres um he talked about his wedding and then they went to monaco because a guy had some money to invest in the chagall musical and they went to the bar and the guy with the drum machine was so good but the guy who wanted to give money for the show didn't really want to do it uh just wanted to have a good time and then john made a call to um i think a record company uh, to have some money to make a record and so uh, he met someone from Cameroon who was good on drums, went to his That's apartment. That's interesting. I just met six. someone from Cameroon. Oh, in, weird. In this three-day thing. Yeah, his name is Alpha. <laughs> hey, yeah, Alpha. So, yeah, so they went to his apartment, wrote six or seven songs in one afternoon, and then went to a studio that John knew in Paris to make the more you know. Um, and a bit more background for Chagall that he mentioned was that um, – so he says the workshop was wonderful and they wanted John to go on stage and speak after the first song. Um, John uh, recalled in the Q and a how he met Mark Chagall, you know, the artist on his 90th birthday and really liked him. I think that might've been around the time of the Paris sessions that yes, we're doing. And oh, way that. back that far, huh? Wow. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And Chagall said to John that making musicals takes a long time, so he might not be around, but to save him a seat. Uh, oh. So John saved a seat so he'd be there in spirit and people really liked that. Uh, I think I remember hearing that. Yeah. Yeah. So at the workshop, there were younger singers and artists and actors from the Academy of Music in San Francisco. And John says they didn't do the whole musical show. They just did eight songs, a lot of spoken word. And um, he says that the show was a test and they're going to do a full version of it maybe in San Francisco later this year. And he wants Kelsey Grammer to play Chagall. And Kelsey has already sang some songs from it, apparently. Wow. Um, it, yeah, he wants other people to get involved in the production. So, yeah, like hearing that Kelsey Grammer could be involved like that. You know, I, you know, I'm such a Frasier fan. Oliver Wakeman is as well as we were in last year. So, yeah. yeah you I'm think curious. Niles will get on board? I mean, that would be fun. <laughs> but Yeah. <laughs> David Hyde Pierce, right? Yeah, David I. Yeah. Pierce, yeah. both great actors. But yeah. yeah, I'm excited that this musical has more going for it now because we'd only heard bits of it, like Picasso, like a couple different versions of that. But right. yeah, I'd, I'd love to see the full show if it becomes available at some point. Um, so I'll try paraphrasing the rest of this uh, Zoom Q&A stuff. Uh, so... I was the first one to ask a question and my question was to John, what was your favorite uh, contribution to a film soundtrack? And he mentioned Loved by the Sun from Legend. Uh, he said he got involved because he had a pint with the director, Ridley Scott, and Ridley asked if he'd like to sing with Tangerine Dream and John wrote the lyrics to it. So let me, if I may, I yeah. remember seeing that in the theater with my girlfriend Jody and had no idea that that Tangerine Dream, let alone with John, was part of the soundtrack. And I remember the scene when that song started to unfold and then oh. he started singing. It was like, wow, I couldn't believe it. Well, back in, I think, 86 is when it came out in the U.S. So. 86? Yeah. Yeah, it was 86, yeah. Wow, I thought it was earlier, so it wasn't with Jody. <laughs> <laughs> it was with your sisters, the mother of your sisters, yeah. Okay. Huh. Yeah, but, yeah. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, and someone else on the call started singing Time the warp. lyrics. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I love that song, so it was really cool to hear that. Um 
someone asked John about an instrument with a curved top that he has. Uh, he joked that his name was George, and uh, he talked about a MIDI guitar that he made. Uh, and uh, he's recalled how he did a whole tour one time in Europe with one, and eventually started doing it around America. Huh. And Jane, you know, John's wife, said it sounds so good. She th that she thinks people think it's a tape. And um, John recalled when a lot of equipment of his got confiscated in Turkey because they thought it was like something else, something dangerous or something. But the next something what was, they thought what they thought it was like a bomb or something. Um, and then the next gig was in Sweden, and people. Uh, just like hearing him on guitar. And then John was trying to remember s the thing he did for XM Radio that got released on DVD. And he was like, what was it called? And so I chimed in and I was like, it was Tour of the Universe. And he was like, who said that? And I said, me, Steven. And he's like, Steven. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, like you and I enjoyed that DVD a while back. So yes, yeah. nice throwback. Um, he mentioned... Uh, doing a little bit of mind drive with i think uh, this was where i wasn't clear if he was talking about the rock academy or the band geeks but at some point in the past they rehearsed a little bit of mind drive oh, and, wow. apparently and uh they're gonna do per the rock academy is gonna do perpetual change uh this year and uh john talked about awaken and how if everything breaks down do a drum solo is like his advice um, yeah, when in doubt, yeah. yeah. You know, that happened. Can I, real quick? Uh, sure. This gig that I played in New Year's Eve, it was going from 1979 into 1980, and uh, I was in the band Assault then, and we were playing at Reseda Theater, which is on Sherman Way in the West San Fernando Valley part of L.A., and the power went out three times during our set, and each time it's like pitch black and I just launched into a drum solo till the lights came back on and then the bit we would continue with whatever song we were doing. <laughs> so yeah, whenever in doubt, give the drummer some. Yeah, and I see uh, Brian McLean commented saying, John did a song from St. Elmo's Fire 2, mid 80s. Yeah, um, in my opinion, the film isn't very good, but the song itself, which you can't really hear it that well because it's in the background in the film, but on its own, the song is incredible. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's called This Time It Was Really Right. So, yeah. Um, so back to the Q&A, uh, someone asked how John got involved with the King Crimson song Lizard back in the early 70s. And he recalled how he and Chris Squire went to a club called Speakeasy in London and they saw King Crimson setting up for uh, apparently their first show. And they played a whole album, and John went up to Robert Fripp and said, that was really good. And Robert was like, yeah, I know. <laughs> and uh, he asked John if he would like to sing a song on the Lizard album. And John, um, John used to go to school early as a kid to watch steam trains, and he'd be train spotting. And there was a green train called Prince Rupert, so... When he was told that the song, that part of the song was called Prince Rupert, uh, he was like, I know that train. And um, they asked him to sing like the tape that they sent him, but he sang it more like a showbiz uh, is how he put it. But then huh. he sang like the tape, like they asked, and that's what we got. Um, and then John was like, and then he stole my drummer and broke my heart. You know, <laughs> that's to Phil right. Burford. Um, someone asks if John intends to work with John Luc Ponty further. And John said he was talking to him the previous week because a couple songs uh, they haven't finished, but Ponty might just be happy to stay in Europe. Um, John also said he can't wait until he's 80. Um, and why uh, for what? Uh, I mean, I think because he's like always excited about like what's to come. It's, oh, okay, it, gotcha. He said, yeah, he said stuff like this in the past as well. But he said, I think he also said that Opus might be finished in the summer. Uh, someone mentioned the Mind Pyramid in the music video Moonlight Desires by Lawrence Gowan. And how apparently sometime recently um, – someone was prevented from climbing the pyramid because it's like off limits now. Yeah. Do you uh, know who Lawrence Gowan is? 
Yeah, he um he's worked with Sticks. He's yeah, he's the, right? Yeah, he's he's amazing. He's great. He's a mm -hmm. really wonderful keyboard player. Yeah. He's a fantastic live performer. Um, when Todd invited Enja and I to see them in September, he was as good as ever. And I know that um, uh, Todd Zuckerman has done other stuff with uh, Lawrence, and he's just a really great musician. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, John was asked about Moonlight Desires and how it got involved with that. He's, he said he was in a studio in LA working with engineer Gary Barlow. Um, and um, he said Vangelis also came to LA around that time and asked John to sing with him at Royce Hall in UCLA. We've heard a bit of those recordings. Mm -hmm. um, John uh, met some, let's see, um, he kind of went on a tangent about uh, meeting some indigenous people and like, pottery that sup supposedly that he and the engineer thought turned off all the equipment oh wow. um yeah but um uh he he mentioned uh when he met long walker and got more involved learning about like indigenous peoples and stuff um but getting back to the question he said uh, when he was in the studio around that time with gary barlow uh, larry gowan was next door and asked if john would like to sing on his record and then three months later uh he was asked to go to mexico city to meet with him because they're working on the music video and john was like i looked like a cosmic hippie <laughs> um and someone uh, on the call wanted john to talk about his harp and he like played a little bit of it oh uh someone asked how he got involved doing god only knows for a brian wilson tribute I think that was last year. He said someone asked him which Beach Boys song he loves, and he said that song and did it with other people and loved it. And someone on the call uh, said it was Paul McCartney's favorite Beach Boys song as well. And, ah, and something, I f okay. And it was around this time that Jane called John on the phone because like she was getting hungry and John's like I, I got five minutes left and then James <laughs> said hi to everyone um, <laughs> and uh the last thing I have on here is uh he elaborated on the John and Vangelis uh their version of State of Independence um and I think John might have gotten like timelines mixed up or maybe he's referring to like something other than when they originally recorded because he said he had just been in Italy working with Yes on Big Generator, and uh, he went to Paris and sang 90% of the lyrics right away. Hmm. Um, yeah, but yeah, that was an interesting Zoom call. And uh, of course, he continues to post stuff on his YouTube channel and on Michael Burns YouTube channel as well. Um, and Bill Bruford, of course, his YouTube channel has some more earthworks and uh solo stuff uh, like in recent weeks uh there's something from bruford borslap so people can check out uh his youtube channel see all this archival stuff this is live in amsterdam 2005 and something else from that year in paderborn apparently um so yeah i'm glad that that channel is still really busy yeah yeah it's nice that he's retired from music quote unquote as far as performing <laughs> and recording, but yet we still get all these gems from him. <clears throat> yeah, and then we got some Rick Wakeman updates. Uh, so he says, he said that January would be a busy month uh, because of preparation for two Palladium shows in February. Um, says his rig would be rebuilt somehow and uh, that would take a lot of time programming for the complicated shows. There's a lot of rehearsal to prepare for, and the band are already hard at it. Uh, he also mentioned that uh, he'd previously mentioned that he felt it was time to retire the English rock ensemble name and invite to new names to be put forward and uh, received many inventive ones. But the majority of replies wanted to retain the English rock ensemble name as it carried history with it and mm. held the memory of many past members who are no longer with us. So uh, it was decided that the band would stay as the English rock ensemble. I think um, that's great. 
Yeah, and then we get uh, an announcement of his upcoming tour. Uh, did you want to read this part? Yeah, um, so this is from a release. It says, Keyboard Wizard, Wizard Rick Wakeman, CBE, is pleased to announce that he will be returning to the USA in March and April of 2023 with his latest tour, An Evening with Rick Wakeman, His Music and Stories, starting Wednesday March 15th in Phoenixville. Got excited for half a second. <laughs> Phoenixville, Pennsylvania. I knew you'd say that. <laughs> <laughs> really? Phoenixville, Pennsylvania. Um, it's so, And he says, it's always so enjoyable playing in America, Wakeman comments. At every show, I see old friends and hopefully make new ones. Wakeman's set will consist of music taken from across the wide breadth of his 50-plus year career, stripped back to its roots in arrangements for grand piano. It will include work from his early days as a session player arranging and performing keyboard keyboards on hits like David Bowie's Life on Life on Mars, through his groundbreaking stint with the progressive rock band Yes, and his own multi-platinum solo albums plus quirky covers of other acts like the Beatles. And by the way, I just want to mention I have that DVD that he did of that type of show from years ago, and it's mm. just wonderful. I love it. Um, and his glorious display of keyboard virtuosity will be punctuated by hilarious anecdotes and reminiscence of his life. Renowned as much for his irreverent sense of humor as his musical talent, as he himself says, all of Wakeman's stories contain an element of truth. It's up to the <laughs> audience to decide how much. That's hilarious. Being that his stories do vary from time to time or accounts of events, right? Right. Um, in departure from his previous solo tours, as well as playing a grand piano, Rick Makeman will also be bringing along wooden clogs and an accordion. Just kidding. It says we'll also be bringing along a few electronic keyboards to add a variety and texture to his set. I'm looking forward to ringing in the changes with the additional keyboard, with the addition of keyboards, which is a bit of a departure from my traditional piano shows, but will give me the opportunity to vary the set list, which is cool. Um, with over 50 million albums sold in five decades and an inviolable reputation as a wit and reconteur, an evening with Rick Wakeman, his music and stories will be an opportunity to share musical memories and riotous reflections in the company of a true rock legend. Um, and then Steve's got a link there that I'm presuming you're, you're going to drop in or you have yeah. and it says yeah. most dates available on rwcc.com with pre-sale on wednesday february 1st coming right up if you're watching this now or in the next couple of days at 10 a.m eastern u.s time pre-sale code available on that day i gotta look at the schedule i i think i saw this schedule yeah i think it's just east coast so yeah far, but... and i was like <laughs> yeah but uh, i think there was an something saying that more dates would be added so hopefully like maybe we'll see him uh like at some point and of course he also has a solo album a gallery of imagination coming out of officially february 24th um it's already been available at on his christmas tour but yeah it'll be interesting to give that a listen has he said who's gonna be in the band, not for the solo tour, but, you know, in the... Oh, the English rock ensemble? Yeah. Um, I didn't... I haven't seen anything about that recently. But, okay. But, yeah. And then uh, Oliver Wakeman has been posting some updates on his upcoming solo album, Anamkara, uh, which I believe is Celtic-inspired. Um, so... On New Year's Eve, he managed to finish the writing and arrangements for it. And he said it reminded him of his first solo album, Heaven's Isle, which was also finished on December 31st, 1996. Huh. Um, and then uh, this past month, there have been recording sessions. Uh, on the 22nd, he said the new album tracks are all written, arranged, and lyrics finalized as of 9.06 this evening about to send everything off to the vocalist who will work her magic on my dodgy guides. Uh, full musician reveal coming soon. And 27th, he said, looking forward to the drum recording sessions 
for the album next week with the great Scott Higgum behind the kit and Carl Groom on engineering duties. It's all starting to come together nicely. And then yesterday he said, great afternoon today going through the electric guitar parts with David Mark Pierce for the new album. There is some great solos on this album up to Dave's usual high melodic standard. Awesome. So, yeah, very excited for all that. And Trevor uh, Horn back in the news too. Uh, yeah. Nice to see that he's so active. Uh, so it says today he rehearsed a clip from his chat with Simple Minds Jim Kerr on their 2019 collaboration. Yeah. Trevor re-shared. Horn. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Re- reshared. Oh, okay. yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Reshared. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Trevor Horn reimagines the eighties from Bonga. Uh, I always mispronounce this. From, oh, so yeah. So this is uh Henry Potts' site, Bonde Gizu. Um, yeah. He Bonde did a Gizu. good, yeah, he did a good rundown of some of the upcoming, uh, Trevor Horn stuff. Um, so, uh, Trevor Horn is working on some sort of follow-up to reimagine the eighties, uh, but without the orchestral element. So, uh, this was from the Hustle podcast uh, last month, mm-hmm. um, and Horn had said, I just knew all the songs from the 80s and thought which ones I'd like to do. I've done the same thing again, but this time not symphonic, and that won't be out till the middle of uh, this year, 2023. Um, and Horn mentioned another project and uh, was asked why there had not been a Trevor Horn solo album. Uh, he replied, I've done one just figuring out what I have. It's me singing with a whole, it's me singing a whole bunch of songs from when I grew up, mainly from the 50s and 60s. So songs that I heard when I was a kid and a couple more modern ones, but not many. Uh, I'm working on the art. I finished the record because the record itself is like a bunch of demos. So that'll be interesting uh, for us because you know, we've been doing the first solo albums by Yes Members uh, series. Um, I think we we still, like, we were debating whether or not to do Igor's, but in any case, like, one of the next ones would be Trevor Horn. And I was, like, debating, like, there are a few different things from Trevor Horn that don't really seem like actual solo albums. Like, there was a compilation, there was a f- soundtrack to something and there was uh this reimagines the 80s but i think sounds- this would be the f- well no the one he mentioned would probably be the first one yeah the one that he's gonna put out next so yeah. i guess that would be um the first solo album of his which we'll cover and we'll cover oliver's as well yep uh, um and there's also an upcoming north american tour from april to june uh so this will feature the Buggles opening for Seal. Uh, the tour will feature Seal's first two albums, which both have the same name, Seal, uh, which are produced by Trevor Horn in full. Plus, according to the promo, expect soul staples and standards peppered throughout the set, showcasing the full spectrum of this incredible repertoire. Uh, and the debut album has recently been reissued in expanded form. A horn will be playing on the tour and is credited as a musical director. And then uh, on Bonte Gazoo, it also adds the support act for the tour will be the Buggles, although presumably a lineup without Jeff Downs, who will be touring with Yes at that time. Uh, that would be the Relayer tour that's happening over in Europe. Supposedly. <laughs> um, and Henry uh, said, I would guess the band will be close to the recent Trevor Horn band lineup. An article by Retropop claims Downs is involved, but I think they've made just made that assumption. So I'm actually going to consider seeing this show because, uh, you know, one of my resolutions was to see more concerts now that I'm in like the L.A. area. Um, next month, I'm going to see Lobate Scarp as well as Moon Letters and Behold the Monolith over at the Knitting Factory on February 20th. Mm -hmm. Um, so maybe I'll see if I'm able to see the Buggles and Seal as well when they come here in June. Um, and then we got an update from Downs Braid Association on their delayed upcoming album, Celestial Songs. And we have a picture of this, which they shared. Uh, so it says received test pressing of the new album, which last we heard was still expected to be released March, 2023. Um, 
So, yeah, I'm hoping that that does still come out in March because we've been waiting on it for a bit. Um, yeah. And then uh, keeping to Jeff Downs, uh, he there's a video of him talking about the upcoming John Wetton biography. It's really nice. We have a couple pictures related to that as well. But um, uh, did you want to read this next bit, Dad, about the John Wetton biography and Extraordinary Life? Yeah. Sorry, let me get to it. There we go. All right. Uh, so musician, songwriter, singer, and top bloke, as Jeff Downs describes him, John Wetton, lived a truly extraordinary life. In this book, some 70-plus people who knew and worked with John from family, King Crimson, Uriah Heep, Wishbone Ash, Roxy Music, UK, Asia, and the John Wetton solo band and beyond pay tribute to the fact. Other contributors hail from the music industry and have compelling tributes to pay, equal to those from friends who knew John for decades and his family. Among the stories of friendships, music, and sometimes craziness of reflections on what made John Wetton such an unforgettable man. His friends and family do not steer clear of his problems, but rather explain why, how, and triumph over them in honest and touching recollections. Scattered among the stories are personal and classic photos of John at work and play, which add to the celebration of an extraordinary life. In quotes, he had a love for fast cars, fine food, coffee, the Rams, that's Derby County for non-football followers, films, books, crosswords, current affairs, sports, languages, classic music, anything that would stimulate his mind that he could use to great effect in his music and lyrics. That's a quote by Jeff Downs. And, you know, um, John Wetton is is truly one of my absolute favorite oh, yeah. vocalists. I just love that voice. He was great with lyrics. I loved the band UK, both with uh, Alan Holdsworth and Bill Bruford and without them, but with Terry Bozio. Um N nothing negative about anything musically that John's ever done from King Crimson and family uh, forward until the end of his career. Just really a tremendous musician, singer, songwriter. I mean, so well-rounded. There's very few, you know, I think the only contemporary that I could think of off the top of my head, not the only, but the first contemporary that I could think of off the top of my head that even comes anywhere to mention as so well-rounded as Billy Sherwood. You know, he's mm -hmm. such a well-rounded musician playing so many different instruments. He produces, he mixes, he masters, he sings lead, he sings background. He, you know, that's the kind of well-roundedness I mean. And John just exemplified that throughout his whole career. Greatly, greatly missed. I got to see UK open for Jethro Tull with Terry mm -hmm. Bozio and of course saw Asia and uh, what a thrill. And met him. Yeah. I got to meet him at... So when Asia was on the first tour, I saw them play at the Santa Monica Civic. And after the show, met him at um, Tower Records on Sunset. Uh, him, Steve, Jeff, and Carl. It was really a thrill for me because there were four of my favorite musicians in the, the first super group of my era, basically. You know, the first real super group is probably Cream. Um, so this was like a, a huge thing for me, and I still have those photos I took. Yeah. So people can go to johnwettenbook.com and sign up for updates. Um, I believe this is due out in the summer, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, they haven't given out a concrete date. but Wrong image I, there. Sorry. <laughs> but um, I, I think it would be nice if they're able to release it on what would have been John Wetton's birthday, which would be in June. I believe that's June 12th. Yeah, June 12th. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of like what they did with the Keith Emerson book. Um, like, I think that would be really nice. Yeah. And um, Jeff Downs also uh, posted recently, very sad to hear of the passing of a great and talented musician and one of our former Asia guitarists, Alan Darby, sending our sincerest condolences to all his family, loved ones, and colleagues. So yeah, Alan Darby was part of a really obscure Asia lineup when they toured in 1989, and I think it was even without Jeff Downs. So, Oh, really? 
Yeah, so it was uh, kind of a strange period, but yeah, I, th um, I, I thought it was really nice that Jeff uh, posted that about him. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, yeah, we, we've been losing people. Like, we lost David Crosby recently. Yeah. That was a huge loss. So Jeff back. It's been rough start. Yeah, yeah but... I mean, that's life, you know, just as people get older. So, yeah, you know, but, you know, paying our respects to all those who leave us. Um, sticking with Asia. So um, I, I was able to make time to listen to the Asia and Asia CDs and watch the Blu-ray. And um, I, I'm really like satisfied with this. Um, mine's right there next to the candle. Yeah, so I gotta the, pull those CDs out and throw them in the truck carousel. Yeah, so with the CDs, they're both uh, like uh, they're both remixed uh, by different people in 2022, and uh, listening to them back to back, I can't really point out major differences, but I'm sure someone else could probably. So come that's up with the a difference. There are two CDs of the same thing, but just mixed by two different people. Uh, yeah, one of them has uh, two people remixing it, and the other has someone else remixing it. Um, and, and that's then, the only difference? It's the same show? Well, duh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> Who are the people? I might know of them. I'm just curious. And and yeah, why? So I'm a little confused. Sorry. Maybe it's one just of, me. One of them, uh, so disc one was remixed by Matt Wiggins and Rick Nelson. Um, and the other, um, I've got the other disc on the other side of the room. I would okay. need to like go grab That's it. That's okay. So, I'm just, I was um, curious. I'll, I'll look. And what a dumb dumb. I should have thought of this last week because Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I drove a hundred miles to this thing I went to every day there and back. I should have been listening to that. Right. Um, yeah, but uh, so for the Blu-ray, there's. Uh, it gives you two options of how to watch it. There's the version that has the entire show and also has like a little bit of narration from like the broadcasters at the beginning and the end. And you see the band members backstage afterward for like a couple minutes. Well, just stop right um, there. Why would you want any other version? Why would someone want, why have even another option? Yeah, well, the other version is the original Laserdisc uh, release, which... Oh. Yeah, but there that one that one cuts out the opening song time again and cuts out the final two songs cutting it fine in daylight and nah. also cuts out the narration backstage. So. Nice collector's item, but I'm going to watch the whole thing. Yeah, like it was nice to see. It's nice that they included it, but if yeah. I have to choose between versions, I would choose the one that has a full concert. For nostalgic purposes, they've got to include it. So that, that makes yeah. sense. I got to figure there, out what it... there are, um, there are alt alternate, uh, camera shots here and there, but, oh, okay. but since I watched them a little bit spaced apart, it was hard for me to tell like what exactly was different, but I felt like watching the laser disc version to me, it felt like some of the cuts were kind of quicker like it would cut to a band member for like a second and then cut back to like something else so maybe the editing just feels like the camera's going back and forth like maybe it's quicker for the laser disc whereas for the longer full concert version it felt smoother to me i'd have to check again but that's and kind I, of the impression that i got i have to figure out if we even have something to play it on. I honestly don't know as silly as that sounds. Oh yeah, I put it on the old PlayStation 3, which is like 15 years old now. Because <laughs> it won't play on a regular DVD player, right? No, and, of course and I, not. <laughs> yeah, and I don't even, oh, stupid question, erase that everybody from your memories. Um, I, I don't even remember if our unit has a Blu-ray, because we usually, we don't, uh, anyways, I'll figure it out. I'll buy one if I have to, because I really want to see this. Yeah, and I um, gave the the booklet that came in the box set a read, and I was kind of surprised to hear that apparently they had played a free show before the broadcast one, and just in case, like, if anything went wrong with, like, the broadcast, they could just cut back to a pre-recorded show. So I think that Carl talked about that, didn't he, when we interviewed him? 
Oh, yeah, when you interviewed him uh, last year oh, on Drum on Talk Drum TV. Talk TV. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. I'd have to look again. But um, another surprise in this is that before John Wetton passed away, there were talks of possibly doing something like Asia and Asia with the same set list, but, you know, with the original lineup. So it'd have John Wetton. Interesting. You know, at, but, of course, you know, um, we lost him, unfortunately. And yeah. But, that would have been a neat idea. Um, Carl still wants to uh, go do Asia and Japan again, like whenever uh, they're able to tour again. Um, huh. And there's a nice quote in this booklet from Roger Dean uh, saying, I never worked with this lineup of Asia, you know, this Greg Lake one. Yeah. Um, so he says, I never worked with this lineup of Asia, nor did I see them perform though I would dearly have loved to. So it has been especially brilliant to have worked on this project now, you know, with this box set and the, yeah. book and the design. So I thought that was really sweet. So overall, I'm pretty satisfied with this box set. Yeah, it, um, I, I agree. I think it was totally worth it. Yeah. If you're a and, fan, it is, you know, it's that simple. Yeah. And recently there was an announcement on the 12th uh, so multi-platinum selling English supergroup Asia announced their to release for the first time ever on vinyl Asia Fantasia live in Tokyo 2007 as a three LP set recorded on Asia's 25th anniversary 2007 world tour and featuring the reformed original lineup um, and is to be issued on vinyl as a three LP set with booklet including band photos and sleeve notes through BMG Records on February 24th. Um, That's cool. Yeah, and uh, this is, this concert, you know, the DVD of it that you got me way, way back. That's what got me into Asia. I was just hooked. From really? I, I forgot about that timeline of your connection yeah, it, with them. It was a thing that showed me, oh, there are great bands other than Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, and, and it's it just, made up of half Yes members. <laughs> yeah, and it just snowballed from... There, so yeah, I, I dearly love this concert. I love the video, and so it's really nice. Uh, um, so and we have like the graphic of the cover of the LP set. So this, um, yeah. So this begs a question. I got to ask if I can interrupt our flow here. Sure. What is your favorite band that is completely un Yes related? No members of of Yes. Um. Is it Pink Floyd, Rush, no, Jethro Tull? Is it that's a Chromatics? Good, is it, 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 it might be Pink Floyd, although I do listen to Chromatics pretty frequently. But yeah, I think it's... Oh, geez, but there's also Rush, man. Yeah. <laughs> um, dang, that's a good question. Do you know yours? Wow, I didn't even see that coming. That's funny. It, it's it's Led Zeppelin, right? It is. It okay. Is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I was turned on to them before I knew about Yes. And this was yeah. this was way back, you know, then, folks. This was. Yeah, I think it might be Rush for me because, yeah. you, you know, they've. Not I Led Zeppelin? Led Zeppelin's great, but with Okay, Rush, you can go now. <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, I, yeah, I totally I, I mean, that. yeah, just for evolution and like, you know, the show, the stage craftsmanship for Pink Floyd is great as well. But Rush is, you know, just it, it's all great. It's yeah, yeah. I, I don't I can't really explain it, but I think it's probably Rush. And for those who don't know, I'm a huge fan of, of both. In fact, I can say this because uh, I have a surprise for someone and, and they're not going to see this. So okay. should I? So so on. Uh, I have a drum student who's sixteen, who's a jazz player, and he came to me. His parents found me through someone else in town to learn how to be a rock musician. So I've been working with him for about a year and three months, and the last song we're working on the revealing science of God right now, actually. <laughs> but this, and you know what, Steve? That's because they couldn't find the live keys version on YouTube. But before that. I gave him his most challenging song and it was YYZ. And in three lessons, he nailed it. He did such a great job. So I've got a couple musician friends in town. Folks, I live in a really small mountain town. There's not a lot of 
there's no one here to jam with because these two guys, guitar player and bass player, are on tour all but two months out of the year. They happened to be home for two weeks, and I didn't know that. I just called him, hey, you still live in town? And he explained. And anyhow, they're coming over Tuesday night, and the lesson is going to be just sit. Him and his dad's a musician, too. Just sit and watch us play. We're going to talk about how to interact as musicians. We're playing the first four instrumentals by Rush in a row. We're playing La Vila Strangiato, then YYZ, then Where's My Thing, and then um, leave, my, leave That Thing Alone. We're playing all four of those, and what he doesn't know is that and the fact that after we play YYZ, I'm going to tell him, now you sit down and play it with the guys. It's going to be fun. It's going to be great. Yeah. A um, little nod to Rush there since Steve brought him up. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and speaking of other bands, uh, Kansas have uh, posted about their tour dates for their 50th anniversary oh, tour. Which means we can announce yeah, that Tom Brislin is finally, we're getting Tom on. Not that he's been resistant. It's just been, <laughs> you know, schedules and this and that. But we're, we're thrilled to have Tom on, who did such a great job on the Yes Symphonic Tour. He's been amazing with Kansas. He was amazing with Meatloaf. Um I've seen one other interview with him a couple years ago. It just seems like such a great guy. We're both connected with him on Facebook, follow each other and all that. And I'm really excited to have Tom on. Yeah. So it's looking like we'll have him on uh, Thursday, February 2nd at 4 p.m. Pacific. So that'd be 7 p.m. Eastern U.S. And I guess that'd be midnight UK time. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Wait, what time? Um, uh. 4 p.m. Pacific. Right. Okay. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I'm going to try to see Kansas this year. They're going to be in L.A. in September, I believe. Um, yeah, just oh. been meaning to see them for a while. So that'll be fun. And for those who don't know, we had. Um... Phil Ehart. Yeah, we had. Phil... <laughs> we had Phil Ehart on Drum Talk TV, which we always simulcast on yes shift as well or do no it's the other way around no, right? well i i share it on to right yeah. right uh that that was cool so yeah i would love to see kansas last time i saw kansas was the tour after steve walsh left can't remember the name of that tour that was okay. decades and that was early 80s or something like that so this that'll be fun um yeah so yeah that'll be really cool to have tom on yeah and uh let's see we're now on the home stretch so other fun yeah, believe it or not it's been a long show folks we're at one hour 12 minutes 20 seconds well we yeah, were now we're, it's 22 seconds yeah well we're almost done so uh over on the internet a uh, video that's been making the rounds is uh london now 71 video that was uploaded to youtube months ago and this contains like a weird art exhibit from back then in 1971, but contains snippets of the Yes album lineup performing Yours Is No Disgrace and America, although performing America a bit differently from what we're used to. So Interesting. Uh, uh, so like an alternate studio version or is it live or? Uh, it's live. It looks live on the stage. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then... Uh, there was also recently a version of Owner of Only Heart over on YouTube, uh, reworked slash remixed by Waldmeister. And it's to, I, I very much prefer this over the seven minute repetitive remix of Owner of Only Heart from the 1980s. Like, I think this is definitely above that. It, it sounds really interesting, very modern. Um, cool. You, yeah, you still hear like John Anderson singing and whatnot, but it's like remix, reworked and whatnot. Um, let's see, Kevin Mul here's some shout outs. Kevin Mulrine from Yes Music Podcast. Uh you can still order his book uh on Tormado from Tormadobook.com and tune in on January 30th, uh, tomorrow for what he calls his tour motto, which seems will take place in London and be posted via Facebook Live. And I believe this is gonna be in the YMP discussion group over on Facebook. Mm. It's going to be at noon uh, UK time. So for me, that would be 4 a.m. Um, I can't guarantee that I'll be watching it that early, but I'll try to catch it if it archives. Um, Joe Luca from Awaken posted part one of a deep dive of the keyboard parts of Close to the Edge. And oh, was, that's cool. 
Yeah, and there will soon be a video of drummer Greg Bonacera's tutorial on the differing styles of Bruford and White. Uh, Awaken's first show of the year will be at 89 North in Patchogue, New York. And also present at that show will be Us and Floyd, uh, Pink Floyd tribute band. I want to read the set list if I could. Yeah, well, this next one is for a uh, Total, Total Master, Master Chain's Chain. yeah. recent uh, Philadelphia show. But yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so this is a cool a cool set list that uh, crosses over some really neat classic music from the band Firebird Suite. Go, I love the live version of Firebird Suite, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Going for the one, all good people, your open favorite. your eyes, 5% <laughs> for nothing. I love that open your eyes is sandwiched between two yeah. songs that are from many removed eras ago, which is really interesting. Very creative way of doing that. Uh, then after 5% for Nothing Long Distance, Run Around Sweet Dreams, then Lift Me Up, Yeah, that's then And one. You and I, then they take a break. I don't know what that's all about. <laughs> and then <laughs> Close to the Edge, Gate to Delirium, Awaken, and Starship Trooper. I have to say, that's like a perfect yes set mixing different eras that's that's perfect you got some trevor in there you got some sherwood era in there uh you got the the first lineup era in there you got patrick you got this is really a very creative i think a lot of thought went into this but you know what i want to make this would be fun i want to make a dartboard but instead of scores it has yes songs Mm. And let's like w videotape us playing darts to put together a yes concert. Okay. Yeah. I'll put that on the list of ideas. And in the have. very <laughs> center would be all good people since none of us would get a bullseye. <laughs> yeah. That's a good one. Um, that's a yeah, not that so inside joke folks. To me, I, I love every yes song, but all good people to me just almost burns a spot now in concert. I hope Steve House not going to be mad at me, but be, because it's like a it's the it's a small world of yes music, and I just think it. To, I'd rather hear just insert something else there. Maybe something you guys have never done live before. Maybe just saying or hardly at all ever. Right, but yeah, I guess that'll do it. I'm. That's had, it. Yeah, we had so much to cover. And, yeah, a lot to cover. Our our yeah. regular episodes. If you're new to us. Our regular episodes are typically an hour or under. Um, our interviews are typically an hour or under. The, the news desk is, it just is what it is. And almost every time I see the, the word doc that Steve sends, and I, and I go, wow, all of this? <laughs> but there's always so much going on, you know, being that Yes was such an institution with so many members and then so many yeah, peripheral projects yes, that they all splintered Asia, off to. All yes, Asia, events. John Loach, Carl Palmer. <laughs> You know, it just goes on and on and on. So that that's why sometimes these are a little bit longer. And, you know, you come and stay for as long as you want. You dip in, you dip out. It's just like a pool. I was in the water. I was in the water. Just, you know, <laughs> I was in the pool. Just do do it the way it, it suits you. But uh, we have fun doing this, and we appreciate you following us. You can write us with ideas or comments, suggestions, criticisms, whatever, <laughs> at yes, shift podcast at gmail.com. You can follow the odd. If you don't want to look at this, you can follow us on anchor.fm slash yes shift. If you're into audio podcasts while you're on the treadmill, running with your dog on a bike, cleaning the house or whatever. Um, and then you can follow us and you might be already on YouTube at yes shift. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, it's at yes. Shift, at, yeah. yeah. The, like the word, right? Or the at yeah. sign. Uh, it, it includes the at sign. If oh, it's okay. YouTube. Yeah. All right. I don't follow us on you. I don't follow us anywhere. <laughs> and on Facebook at <laughs> facebook.com slash yes shift and dive in. We've got over a hundred episodes, interviews with Carl Palmer, Billy Sherwood, yeah. Steve Howe. Well, I mean, Carl, it was a drum talk TV, but yeah. Didn't we curate it onto our channel as well? No. Uh, I think we shared mm. it, but okay. Yeah. We'll get them back on too to talk some Asia stuff. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now, Oliver, we got with Oliver. Uh, there's some great interviews. Not that we're great, but the guys we <laughs> interviewed are great. And women. We've had some great, great ladies on the yeah, show. Claire Talk about Hamill, that, Annie Haslam. So, yeah. Yeah. 
All related um, to the yes verse. Yeah. Also, uh, Joe Emerson with Aaron Emerson. So, yeah, yeah. Talking we, about the book of our key. Yeah, Chris we, Welsh. We interviewed a bunch of people. So yeah. yeah. It's wow. Great. I'm worn out. I need a nap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks. So thanks for following us and tune in on Thursday, 4 p.m. Pacific for the Tom Brislin interview. We will post about it in the lead up and uh, we'll see you all soon. Thanks, everyone. Oh, <laughs>